good evening. I'm here to present um, a seminar on zygomatic complex fractures and orbital fractures. And Dr. D.P. Vivakar, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, Sri Baraji Temple College in Malaysia. Coming to zygomatic complex fractures. Uh, the zygoma or mela complex forms the central support of the cheek and is a strong buttress to the lateral and middle third of the facial skeleton. It is for this reason that it is either frequently fractured alone or in combination with other bony structures of the mid face. Zygomatic or malar fractures are the terms which commonly are used to describe fractures that involve the lateral one third of the middle face. Other names for this fracture are zygomatic or maxillary complex, zygomatic or maxillary compound, zygomatic or orbital, zygomatic complex, malar, trimalar, and tripod. Uh, this is a uh, a diagrammatic uh, representation of the vertical buttresses, the nasofrontal, nasoepimoidal buttress, zygomatic, and pterygomaxillary. Coming to the horizontal buttress, superior, middle, and inferior. Sitcha and Debrol were the first to depict facial anatomy in terms of structural pillars or buttresses. So, this concept allows consideration of an approach for reduction of mid face fractures and ultimately production of a stable reconstruction. There is an azomaxillary buttress, pterygomaxillary, or posterior buttress lateral or zygomatic or maxillary buttress. These buttresses will help the zygoma, uh, help give the zygoma an intrinsic strength. Uh, zygomatic bone complex, the anatomy is uh, star-shaped like with four processes, which is the temporal process, frontal process, maxillary process, and the orbital process. Uh, from a frontal view, the zygoma can uh, be seen to articulate with three bones, medially by the maxilla, superiorly by the frontal bone, and posteriorly by the greater wing of the sphenoid within the orbit. From a lateral view, the temporal process of the zygoma joins the zygomatic process of the temporal bone to form the zygomatic arch. So uh, this is a uh, diagrammatic representation of the uh, anatomy of the facial bones. Uh, coming to the muscle attachments, the muscle attachments to the zygoma include the meseta, zygomaticus major, zygomaticus minor, levator, labi superioris, temporal, temporal muscle, and the fascia. Foramen are the zygomatico facial foramen and the zygomatico temporal foramen. Functions of the zygomatic bone include the protection of the globe of the eye gives the origin to the meseta muscle, transmits part of the mas mas masticatory forces to the cranium, absorbs forces of an impact before it reaches the brain. Some applied points. Zygomatic bone represents a strong bone on fragile support. The traumatic force distributed through the adjacent comparatively weaker articulating bone. The coronoid process of the mandible will move between the arch and the infratemporal fossa. The temporal fascia attached to the zygomatic bone Whereas the temporalis muscle via its tendon inserted into the tip and anteromedial surface of coronoid process of the man, uh, mandible. The space between the fascia and the muscle provides a route to approach the posterior surface of the zygomatic bone and the medial aspect of the arch. Coming to the fracture patterns. The fracture lines pass through the areas of greatest weakness of bone or between the bones. Owing to the strong buttressing nature of the zygoma and the thin bone surrounding it, most injuries involving the zygoma are frequently accompanied by disruption of adjacent articulating bones. Uh, this is a diagrammatic representation of zygomatic arch fractures. Uh, the vertical axis shows displacement of fracture in the horizontal plane, blow in uh, front of vertical axis, outward movement of uh, center of zygomatic arch is observed and blow behind the vertical axis, there's an outward displacement of the infraorbital rim and flow. Coming to the horizontal axis, it shows displacement in the vertical plane. Impact above uh, leads to medial rotation of the frontal process and slight outward rotation of the buttress. Impact below uh, the horizontal axis will lead to lateral movement of the frontal process and medial displacement of buttress into the anterior cavity. Coming to the mechanism of injury, zygomatic fractures occur as a result of direct impact to the bone, which causes fractures at one or more of its processes. So direct blows usually impact on a prominent portion like the malar prominence, uh, malar eminence, um, leads to a relative uh, bending at the point of impact and a relative outbending uh, at weaker points. 
Bilateral fractures are seen following higher energy. Zygoma fractures are generally dislocated posteriorly and inferiorly and are frequently dis, uh, dislocated posteriorly, inferiorly and medially. The direction of the dislocation of the zygoma may involve rotation around several planes. So there are several classifications. Some of the classifications are the Knight and Knot classification, Rowe and Klee, Yanagi Sawa, Larson and Thompson, Rowe and Williams, Fosbillow's classification, Marcus Zink classification, Manson and colleagues, Henderson's classification, the Zink classification, and Ozzy Yagzan classification. Coming to the Knight and Knot classification, group one is undisplaced fractures, group two is the arch fractures, group three is unrotated body fractures, and group four, merely rotated body fractures. Now, group five includes laterally rotated body fractures and group 6 is a complex fractures. Next is the row and Killies classification. Type 1 involves no significant displacement. Type 2 isolated fractures of the zygomatic arch. Type 3 fractures rotated around a vertical axis. 3A includes internally, 3B is externally. Type 4 fractures rotated around a horizontal axis. 4A being medially, 4B being laterally. Type 5 Fracture displacement of the complex end block, 5A being medially, 5B being inferiorly, 5C being laterally. Type 6, displacement of the orbital flow, 6A being inferiorly, 6B being superiorly. Type 7, displacement of the orbital rim fragments. Uh, and type 8, complex comminuted fractures. Zygomatic complex fractures as given by Rowe and Williams. Fractures stable after elevation that er involves arch only, which is medially displaced. Uh, B, rotation around the vertical axis, which is again subdivided into medially and laterally. Fractures unstable after elevation, arch only. B, rotation around the horizontal axis, which is further divided into medially and laterally. Dislo uh, C being dislocations and block, which is inferiorly, medially and posterolaterally. Comminuted fractures is the next Rose classification in the year 1985, fractures which are stable after elevation. Again, fractures, uh, rotation around the vertical axis. So basically, these are the diagrammatic representations of the above mentioned classification. This is uh, to represent inferiorly displaced fractures. The next being rotation around the horizontal axis. The next being dis uh, dislocations N block, inferiorly and posteriorly. Coming next to the Larson and Thompson classification, group A stable fractures, group B unstable fractures, group C predicted stable fractures. Next is fractures of the zygomatic arch alone, which involves minimum or no displacement. <clears throat> Yanigasiwa classification. So groups 1 and 2 being unchanged, group 3 being medial or lateral rotation around the vertical axis. Group 4 being medial or lateral rotation around a longitudinal axis. Group 5 being medial or lateral displacement without rotation. Group 6 being isolated rim fractures. Group 7 being all complex fractures. Phosphilos classification, inward and downward displacement, inward and posterior displacement, outward displacement to the zygomatic complex, comminution uh, and fracture of the arch alone. Next being Marcus Zink classification. I, type A is incomplete zygomatic fractures. Type B, complete monofragment zygomatic fracture. Type C being multifragment zygomatic fracture. Manson and colleagues, based on the findings in CT scans, based on the pa pattern of segmentation, displacement, and amount of energy dissipated by facial bones, secondary to traumatic force, high energy, moderate energy, low energy fractures. Henderson's classification, type 1 undisplaced. Type 2, zygomatic arch fracture only. Type 3, tripod fractures with undistracted frontozygomatic suture. Type 4 being tripod fractures with distracted frontozygomatic suture. Type 5 being pure blowout fractures of the orbit. Type 6 being fractures of the orbital rim only. Type 6, type 7 being comminuted fracture or other than above. Next is the Zing's classification. Based on anatomic points, it's divided into three categories. Category A. Uh, category B and C, A being isolated fracture of one of the three processes, category B being fracture of all four processes, category C being same as type C but, but with fragmentation including the body of zygoma. Uh, next is the Aussie Axan et, et al. classification where uh, they have given the classification for arch fractures. 
isolated zygomatic arch fractures, dual fractures, more than two fractures, V-shaped fractures, displaced fractures, type 2 being single uh, fracture and type 2 being plural fractures. <clears throat> so uh, this is a detailed explanation. Then there's a new proposal of classification of zygomatic arch fractures. Classification of zygomatic arch fractures uh, type 1 being isolated, which has subdivisions dual or more than two fractures, type 2 being combined zygomatic arch fractures. Coming to the signs and symptoms of a, zygoma a zygomatic complex fracture, flattening of the cheek, swelling of cheek, periorbital hematoma, subconjunctival hemorrhage, ecchymosis and tenderness, intra orally over zygomatic buttress, limitation of ocular movement, diplopia, enophthalmus, lowering of the pupil level, epistaxis, Tenderness over orbital rim and frontozygomatic suture, step deformity of intraorbital margin, separation at frontozygomatic suture, limitation of mandibular movement, anesthesia of cheek, temple, upper teeth, and gingiva, possible gagging of back teeth on injured side. Coming to the diagnosis, first step is to assess the neurological status, as we all know. Associated neurologic injury was encountered in about 57% patient, uh, percent of the patients, as per a study which was uh, performed by Manolidis, Weeks, Kirby, et, et al. Coming to the Excuse me. Uh, clinical ex uh, examination, inspection performed from frontal, lateral, superior and inferior views. Palpation should be systematic and thorough. Orbital rims with index finger, lateral orbital rim with index finger and thumb. Fractures are mostly associated with step deformity and tenderness. Zygoma in the arch are best palpated with two or three fingers in circular mo uh, motion. Next is intraoral palpation. So periorbital examination will reveal the presence of edema, circumorbital ecchymosis, subconjunctival hemorrhage, orbital emphysema. If there are any lacerations present, that would be also noticed. Tosis, canalicular injury, canthal tendon displacement. You have to also check for the visual acuity, visual fields, pupils and diplopia. Then coming to the extraocular movements. Flattening of uh, mela prominence, unequal pupillary level. Next is a radiographic examination, posterior antero, uh, postero anterior oblique view. Uh, is an excellent assessment of sinuses and the wall, zygoma and its processes, submento vertex view. Uh, so this is an example of a normal uh, water's view or the PA oblique view. You can usually see a teardrop sign in case of a, a fracture. Next is a submento vertex radiograph. Uh, CT scans as we all know. Uh, so examining uh, zygomatic injury is given um, in this particular diagram. Uh, so, if the body of the zygoma is depressed, one finger will be lower than the other. You have to feel for tenderness and feel inside the mouth as well. Treatment, as early as possible, uh, the, it has to be treated unless there are ophthalmic, cranial or medical complications. Periorbital edema and ecchymosis uh, obscure the fine details of the fracture. So, the ideal indications for treatment include diplopia, restriction of mandibular movements, restoration of normal contour, restoration of normal skeletal protection for the eye. Management of ZNC and arch fractures depends on the degree of displacement and resultant aesthetic and functional deficits. Treatment ranges between simple observation of resolving swelling, extraocular muscle dysfunction and paresthesia to open reduction and internal fixation of multiple fractures. So coming to the goals, diplopia has to be corrected, eye muscle functions to be restored, mandibular movements have to be rendered free, facial contour, reposition, proper restoration of bony anatomy, prophylactic antibiotics, anesthesia, clinical examination and forced reduction test, protection of the globe, antiseptic preparation, reduction of the fracture, assessment of the reduction, determination of necessity for fixation. Coming to the steps in the surgical treatment, application of fixation device, internal orbit reconstruction, assessment of ocular mobility, bone graft, extraorbital osseous defects, soft tissue resuspension, post-surgical ocular examination and post-surgical images. A standard series of approaches have been used extensively for approaching the fractured ZMC in orbit. So the existing lacerations often used for this purpose. In the absence of lacerations, properly placed incisions offer excellent access. Coming to the general principles, avoid important neurovascular structures. Use a long, as long an incision as possible. Placing incision perpendicular to the surface of non-hair bearing skin. Place incision in the line of minimal tension and seek other favorable sites. Indirect reduction approaches is a temporal approach given by Gili. Buckle sulcus approach, Keen's approach or the Vala Subramanian approach. Lately, thoronoid approach, Queen's approach, eyebrow approach, Dingman and Nathwick, percutaneous approach, Strawmayer. So coming to the temporal approach, it was first described by Gili. The advantage is it allows the application of greater amount of controlled force to disimpact even the most difficult zygomatic fracture. So it's used for the treatment of fractures which are consolidated already. 
quick and simple method disadvantage encounter temporal vessels hemorrhage so this is um, a diagrammatic representation uh, of uh, how the gilles temporal approach is carried out uh, placement of the rose uh, zygomatic elevator and elevation firm out uh, upward and outward force to the lifting handle so a modified temporal incision and alternative approach has been mentioned in this particular article by michael prakasham r s dollars etc uh, buckle sulcus approach it's also called as a keens technique it avoids any external scar so a small inc incision approximately 1 cm is made in the mucobuccal fold just beneath the zygomatic buttress of the maxilla a heavier instrument is inserted behind the infratemporal fossa of the zygoma and using superior lateral and anterior force the surgeon reduces the bone technique of the lateral coronoid approach simple method for isolated arch fractures 3 to 4 cm incision anterior border of the ramus the depth of the temporal muscle insertion instrument between the temporal muscle and the zygomatic arch readily palpable a flat bladed instrument insert into the pocket the arch is elevated elevation from the upper eyelid approach uh, it has the advantage um, uh, the fracture of the orbital rim is visualized the fracture this point can be um, visualized uh, using this particular uh, incision disadvantage is difficult to generate a large amount of uh, superior direction is uh, the dingman zygomatic elevators use percutaneous approach most simple of all techniques as no soft tissue dissection is necessary advantage is it produces forces anteriorly laterally and superiorly in a very direct manner without having to negotiate adjacent structures with the instruments disadvantage the scar is very noticeable elevation of zygoma with a bone hook force pillows intersecting lines are used stab incision is made and hook is inserted apply strong traction tall clip reduction is also uh, mentioned in a uh, few articles this is uh, the in this particular article we get a detailed representation of how this particular procedure has to be performed use of a curved mosquito for reducing isolated zygomatic arch fractures the next one is a direct reduction surgical approaches are maxillary maxillary vestibular approach supraorbital eyebrow approach upper eyelid approach lower eyelid approach transconjunctival approach coronal approach maxillary vestibular approach a maxillary vestibular approach is one of the most useful when performing any of a wide any wide variety of procedures in the mid face it allows relatively safe access to the entire facial surface of the mid facial skeleton from the zygomatic arch to the infraorbital rim to frontal process of the maxilla so in this uh, particular method the scar is uh, hidden uh squamate surgical anatomy these are the structures which are present in frontal nerve nasolabial musculature buccal pad of fat technique is an incision through the mucosa submucosa facial musculature and periosteum is placed up periosteal dissection is carried out and then closed up lateral brow approach approach uh, access to the lateral orbital rim and the frontal zygomatic suture simple safe and rapid approach scar is usually hidden within the confines of the eyebrow supraorbital approach a previously popular incision used to gain access to the supra suprolateral orbital rim is a eyebrow incision advantage is no important neurovascular structures is involved it gives a simple and rapid access to the frontal zygomatic area uh, also the scar is not very visible this advantage is uh, in people uh, in individual who has no eyebrows extending laterally and inferiorly along the orbital margin this is very undesirable um uh, very limited access is obtained so incision within the confines of the eyebrow hair the incision is made through the skin and subcutaneous tissue to the level of the periosteum in one stroke incision through the periosteum along lateral orbital rim and superiorly dissection in lacrimal fossa because of the concavity just behind the orbital rim in this area the periosteal elevator is oriented laterally as the section proceeds posteriorly closure uh, it is closed in two layers upper eyelid approach the upper eyelid approach to, uh, to the supra or lateral orbital rim is also called as the upper blepharoplasty upper eyelid crease and supra tarsal fold approach in this approach a natural skin crease in the upper eyelid is used to make the incision Uh, so the incision may be extended farther laterally if necessary. The internal incision is made to the skin and the muscle. Sagittal section to orbital and globe showing dissection between the orbicularis oculi muscle and the levator aponeurosis below and orbital septum above. To facilitate retraction of the skin or muscle flap, it can be widely undermined laterally and retracted with small retractors. Because of the concavity just behind the orbital rim in this area, the periosteal elevator is oriented laterally as dissection proceeds posteriorly. Again, it's closed in two layers. Next is a lower eyelid approach. subsilary incision is made to approximately 2 mm below the eyelashes and can be extended laterally as necessary it is made through skin only the incision must follow the crease as it tails off next one is a transconjunctival approach it's um, also called as the inferior fornix approach 
So um, there are two types, the preceptal and retroceptal approach. It produces excellent cosmetic results because the scar is hidden in the conjunctiva. If a canthotomy is performed in conjunction with the approach, the only visible scar is a lateral extension which heals with an inconspicuous scar. So another advantage is that these techniques are pretty rapid. Disadvantage, medial extent of the incision is limited by the lacrimal drainage system. So this gives a technique. Next is a coronal approach. Uh, or coronal or the bitemporal incision is a versatile surgical approach to the upper and middle regions. Uh, the surgical scar is hidden within the hairline. When the incision is extended into the pre auricular area, the surgical scar is inconspicuous. So this is a uh, technique, incision placement. The tension through periosteum should be 3 to 4 centimeters superior to the orbital rims. Amount of exposure obtained with complete dissection of the upper and middle facial bones using the coronal approach. Next is a hemi-coronal approach. Uh, coming to the modification, the anterior arm of the in incision is curved downwards towards the superior wall of the orbit before it reaches the vertex of the skull within the hairline. The back cut provides excellent exposure of the entire zygomatic complex and the arch is aesthetic and is less invasive, thereby being quite acceptable by patients. Next is immobilization. Common methods include wire osteosynthesis and rigid fixation. Less common methods include external pin fixation, maxillary anterior support, pin fixation. It can be used for fractures that demonstrate an intact body to zygoma, but severe comminution with, uh, with the surrounding uh, structures, internal pin fixation. Sinus packing support, gauze or balloon can be used to provide inferior support to zygoma. Lateral wall is approached through a corbel loop procedure. Half inch gauze uh, dipped in antibiotic of choice is placed along the floor anteroposteriorly. Anteral balloon can be used by it uh, as it's relatively imprecise and cannot adapt to the topography. Next, uh, coming to the applied aspect, these are the applied aspects, access to the zygomatic buttress region, modified intraoral buccal sulcral support, uh, uh, then coming to the access to frontal zygomatic buttress, upper eyelid approach, supraorbital eyebrow approach, heavy coronal approach. These are the various approaches. The need for fixation indications are comminuted fracture fragments, doubt regarding the stability, role of meseter in displacement. Uh, this is uh, again about the purpose of fixation. Uh, it is to restore the vertical height, malar projection, facial width and orbital volume. Coming to wiring, generally a wire in the zygomatic or frontal suture and at the infraorbital rim prevents inferior displacement. In case of displaced fracture, three wire fixation zygoma usually provides stable fixation, inferior rim wiring, frontal zygomatic suture wiring, buttress region wiring. Wire fixation advantages are material availability, minimal incision necessary, ease of use. Disadvantage is wires will stretch, provides one dimensional stability, zygoma malpositioning and malunion, and it requires direct apposition of bone and fracture site. So this gives a technique of wiring. Coming to indirect fi uh, fixation, transfacial wire, transnasal wire, zygomatic or maxillary wire, zygomatic or palatal wire. External fixation uh, is accomplished usually with wires suspended from plaster head caps, head frames, and by pins connected to one another with universal joints and cold cure acrylic. The advantage is being three-dimensional stability, minimal scarring, adjustability of the reduction. And also the disadvantages are patient comfort is compromised and there is lack of usefulness and comminuted fracture. These are the various uh, principles of fixation techniques. Use uh, self-threading bone screws, use hardware that will not scatter post-operative CT scans. Place at least two screws through the plate on each side of the fracture. Avoid important anatomic structures. Use as thin a plate as possible in the periorbital areas. Place as many bone plates in many locations as necessary for ensuring stability. Bone plates, four point fixation, comminuted ZMC fractured sites of fixation, Z suture, infraorbital rims, zygomatic arch, maxillary buttress. Three point fixation is used for non comminuted ZMC fractures. Sites of fixation is the FC suture, infraorbital rims, zygomatic arch, or the maxillary buttress. Two point fixation is usually done in simple non comminuted ZMC fractures, sites of fixation being the FG suture, infraorbital rim, and buttress. Fixation of the first plate, uh, placement of the second plate, placement of the third plate if required. Complications uh, minor complications include dehiscence, hematoma, seroma, lymphedema, vertical shortening of lower lid. Prevention, uh, superior support of lower lid for several days. Ectropion, entropion. Infraorbital nerve injury is also observed. Persistent diplopia, commonly known as double vision, is also seen. Enophthalmus, most commonly caused by increased volume of the orbit. It's difficult to correct secondarily. However, improvement is possible. Next is blindness, occasionally reported after ZMC fractures. Maxillary sinusitis, which is caused by inflammation of the sinus membrane and occlusion of the ostium.
ankylosis of the zygoma to coronoid process malunion of the zygoma coming next to orbital fractures classification orbital wall fractures can be classified into blowout fractures pure blowout fractures impure blowout fractures blown fractures isolated orbital wall fractures roof floor needle wall lateral wall isolated fractures of the orbital rim superior rim inferior rim medial rim lateral rim complex comminuted fractures naso ethmoidal and fronto naso orbital fractures pathophysiology of orbital fractures in the event of trauma thick rim uh, protect the eye wall absorbs the shock by fracturing themselves orbital walls especially medial wall and the floor fracture in an isolated way gets displaced inwards or outwards which is called as a blow in or blow out fractures pure blow out or blow in fractures orbital walls are fractured in isolation impure blow out or blow in fractures walls plus the rim blow out fracture is a term, term coined by smith and regan the pathophysiology is a buckling theory this th theory states that if a force was to strike any part of the orbital rim it will cause walls to undergo a rippling effect and the force striking the rim will transfer to the weaker portion especially the floor and cause them to distort and eventually fracture clinical features circumorbital edema subconjunctival bleeding anophthalmus eyeball will sink hanging drop appearance unilateral epistaxis numbness diplopia vertical gauge anophthalmus following blood fracture retract retracting action of the extraocular muscles in ophthalmus diplopia entrapment of the inferior rectus and inferior obliques blow in fracture fragmented bones of the orbital floor are displaced into the orbit proptosis or the exophthalmus more commonly seen in fractures of orbital roof clinical examinations initial ophthalmological evaluation periorbital examination visual acuity using the snellens chart ocular motility using post suction test pupillary responses visual fields using the hess chart fundoscopic examination using tonometry hertel exophthalmometer exophthalmometer post suction test is you prior to the performance of a post suction test a cotton tipped applicator is soaked with topical anesthetic drops and held against the limbus for a few minutes fine tooth forceps are then used to grasp the conjunctiva and tenons capsule just posterior to the limbus the patient is then asked to look in the direction of restriction of movement of the eye next is a snellens chart and tonometer management uh, this is a flow chart which gives the management of orbital fractures in case of a functional deficit or a cosmetic deformity indications for surgical management unresolving soft tissue entrapment with disabling diplopia in ophthalmus greater than 2 mm ct scan evidence of a large fracture surgical management close reduction transantrally using a corbel loop procedure transnasally through inferior turbinate foley's catheter incision the existing lacerations can be used if not lower eyelid subciliary subtarsal intraorbital approaches transconjunctival approach to the lower eyelid reconstruction material um, these are some of the reconstruction materials that are used preformed orbital implants can be used the advantage is being radio opacity smooth surface minimal or no contouring which will be necessary disadvantage is the cost next is bone grafts the disadvantage being additional donor site is required possible contour and dimensional changes due to v modeling difficult to shape according to patient's anatomy porous polyethylene sheets these are resorbable material uh, next is resorbable materials thermoplastic and non thermoplastic materials the advantage is being availability handling contourability smooth surface and smooth edges disadvantage is no radio opacity degradation of material with possible contour loss sterile infection or inflammatory response difficult to shape according to patient's anatomy less drainage from the orbit complications some of the early complications include hemorrhagic or orbital hematoma lateral canthotomy indicated when decreased visual acuity intraocular pressure uh, more than 40 mm hg proptosis ophthalmoplegia ocular cardio cardiac reflex or the trigeminal cardiac reflex or the trigeminal vagal reflex is a very important complication the ocular cardiac reflex pathway begins with the afferent fibers of the long and short ciliary nerves that travel with the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve to the gazerian ganglion via the sensory nucleus of the trigeminal nerve in the floor of the fourth ventricle short internuncial fibers in the reticular formation connect them with the efferent pathway from the motor nucleus of the vagus nerve to the depressor nerve ending in the muscle tissue of the heart late complications altered vision diplopia ectropion epiphora anophthalmus thank you